some uh, some music, I guess. So whenever, are we ready? Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Really. We got yeah. yeah. Here at the corner of Bertan and Ward. How's everybody feeling? Good. Um, I know this is really difficult because there's only two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, 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 the fact, you know, if a bunch of folks were to show up for these uh, rallies because they're so important. I'm a mother, and I'm a single mother. Those are two really good reasons for me to be here, for my children, their children, and everybody's children. So I'm going to sing two songs. I'll need some volume. I'm going to sing one original song that I wrote um, just it, right after the, the first Occupy movement a year ago today. This is a very special day, you guys. Come on. I want to whoop, whoop, whoop. One, two, three. Whoop, whoop, whoop. A round of applause for all the people who have worked so hard on this issue. And a round of applause for yourselves for being here, man. Okay, we just need a little volume on two. The first song I'm going to sing for you is uh, a song called Woodstock by Joni Mitchell that addresses the situation pretty articulately. Sorry. i got to get everything organized here. Yeah. All right. He said, I'm going on down to Thomas Square Park, joining a rock and roll band on a camp out on the land. I get my soul free. I need my guitar. We are stardust. We are gold dust. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Can I walk beside you? I don't know what's happening, but I'm coming to lose the spot. I feel like I'm sunk in some kind of cold. <laughs> Cut with no sound. <laughs> Hang on just one minute. Let's, uh, let's, let's do this right. Let's Sorry. do it right. Let's okay, do it. let's pull that out. Yeah. Pull the body down. Whoops. Yeah. No, no. no. Thanks. Not right. All right. All right. There we go. Well, then, <laughs> testing one, two, three. Okay. Can I walk? No. Okay, so I'm going to stand right here. Hang on just a minute, you guys. Sorry, but there's no use in trying to do right. this. I might as well right. do it acoustic. Right.
some tech problems here. A bunch of it, uh, See, <laughs> there's a reason for everything. Exactly, yes, there is. That's it. You're, you're now live. Live? What did I catch you? <laughs> this is it. Cameras everywhere. This is what you need in order to document stuff. This is the true keeper of freedom right This here. is the keeper of freedom. Right. One of these. The keeper of freedom and the keeper of anything ill. <laughs> you right. see everything. You see everything. Big brother, we are watching. Just one, two, three. Okay, now I'll meet definitely. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. There we go. Testing one, two, three. There we go. As soon as I talk, I'm shorting out. Testing one, two. Three. Oh yeah, when you when you get the summit. voice, it cuts out the sound of the guitar. Yeah, that's weird. All right, y'all. Uh, nope. Uh, we're just going to go straight. Okay. So, uh, turn the guitar down. Okay. Do you have another mic? you got another mic? I'm just oh, going to yeah. mount them. Yeah. So you guys will just have to be quiet. I'll just get close.
Oh, well, well, we'll get you. We'll see. All right. This next song, we actually are going to be mic'd for. Woo! And um, uh, this next song is something that was inspired by last year's uh, maiden voyage into this Occupy movement, which is a very important date in history. I, I can't believe that uh, there's uh, so few of us here. I'm just so happy that we're here. Uh, so really, thank you for coming, and a lot of people are going to thank you in the long run. And it might be a long run, but I have a feeling it's uh, not going to be so long. If I could just get a, a little warmth in my vocal uh, mic, uh, that'd be great. And I'm going to I'm going to be whipping whipping you la 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 la. So you have another mic stand? Yeah, I need to. Bill, could you hold this down? <laughs> We need somebody to hold the mic. We do this a lot here. It's very standard practice here at Occupy. We just Thank you so much. we got people. You'll have to um, um, get close. Yeah. yeah. Uh, You're the mic stand. Yeah. We use human mic stand. Won't be able to pay you much. If we could mic check the guitar, we'd do it. Testing one, two, three, and it, and a little yeah. Thanks. A little reverb on the vocals. All right. So we'll have to be pretty pretty close, I'm afraid. I can't get any more close to you, Rob. Okay. This is called Own Your Own. Maybe just a little bit closer. And turn up the guitar track. Well, they're getting pretty good now. After a couple thousand years separating people from people from the land I'm from, good ideas and making us feel hopeless, we're helpless and lame. As if we really didn't know how to really make a change. How strange. They're getting a little scared now Hearing so many voices Get together to sing about making A different choice As a family Not as peasants And an aristocracy Can you tell me who they are? Anyway But we all have a right to be here, everyone, every plant and stone, every mother has the right to give her children a home, all our blood and all our tears, and all the seeds that we have sown, we're going to lay them down before an altar, or a throne on your own. Many of us are saddled like horses for the Some of us in shackles and some of us in hiding. Just being who we are, using our own minds. If our horses weren't so high, I think we'd all come to realize. Ain't no one in divine. Right to 
to be here. Everyone, every plank and stone. Every mother has the right to give her children a home. All our blood and all our tears. And the seed that we have sown. We're going to lay them down before an altar. For a throne. Turn it on your own. Mahalo, everybody. Mahalo. Let's keep up the really uh, phenomenal work. It's going to take a hell of a lot more work, obviously. But I do feel in my gut and in my heart, and I, and I listen to them very deeply all the time, so I know what I'm hearing. And it's going to happen. We're going to keep the faith. This cannot go on. So I say, down with drugs. Only the good can. No drugs. Just say no to drugs. No to GMO. Let me hear you say no GMO. What? No GMO. GMO. One more time. No GMO. Come on. No GMO. March 2, UH Manoa, we're going to hear some uh, a presentation on GMOs by Juanita Matthews of the University of Hawaii. It's coming up to the stage right now. That's not Juanita, that's Jay. All right. So I would like to thank you for that. That was beautiful. Mahalo. Um, next, we got Juanita Matthews. Um, she has a PhD, and she works in uh, brain, brain, uh, no, stem cell research. Or, here, I'll let you, you tell <laughs> Juanita Matthews, everybody. Woo! Hello, it's nice to see everybody out here. It's great that these uh, gatherings are getting larger and larger. Um, I'm a genetic engineer. I actually do work on genetically modifying organisms, but I don't do it in food. Uh, I actually come and I speak up against it because I really realize what the risks are that are involved in the technology. Uh, I really think that more scientists need to come and speak at these things because the public doesn't really have an understanding of what exactly is being done in these plants. And I think that, you know, I don't know if 
anybody recently uh, saw that there was a letter to the editor by the uh, president of Syngenta, and he wrote, and he basically wrote and said that all the people that were against uh, GMOs and the whole label it crowd were ignorant and didn't have any scientific evidence to back up, you know, all of these problems and things that we're, we're trying to bring up. And so I was really upset about that because that's not true. There's actually quite a few studies that show that these uh, genetically modified plants are, are not a good thing and what kind of effects they're having on our health. <clears throat> so I just kind of want to explain a little bit about what the main uh, crops are and the reasons why they're problematic. Uh, so one of the big ones is BT, right? So BT corn, cotton, all sorts of different plants, right? And what BT is, is BT is a, um, uh, it's a spore coat protein. So there's this bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, and it lives in the soil. And uh, in order to protect itself from being eaten by insects, it creates this little spore coat. It's kind of like this protective coating around the bacteria. And when an insect eats it, that spore coat goes into the insect's stomach and makes a hole in the stomach. And so then the insect dies, basically, because its stomach has a whole bunch of holes in it. And so the reason why they decided that BT would be a good thing to use as a pesticide is because in order for it to do that, it has to be in an alkaline environment, right? And our stomachs are not alkaline. Our stomachs are acidic. And so that protein will not do what it does in an insect in a human being. And so for a long time, it was like, I believe the 1930s, they started spraying BT toxin on plants. And they were spraying it all over the plants, and it worked. I mean, nobody was getting real sick off of it. But they decided, hey, you know, we have to keep reapplying this stuff, and we don't want to keep reapplying it. And so why don't we make it so that the BT toxin is actually in the plant? Right? That way we don't have to continually spend money on more BT toxin. And so they thought, well, hey, if, if the BT toxin doesn't hurt people when it's outside of the plant, then there should be no reason why it would hurt people when it's inside of the plant. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. So the BT toxin was changed. It was modified in, from its normal natural form to become even more toxic so that it would kill insects even better. And it was put under the control of what we call a promoter, which means that it's, it's what drives the expression of the gene. It's what drives the making of that particular BT toxin. And they put it under a really strong one. So that means that the amount of BT toxin that you're getting when you eat a plant that has the BT toxin in it is nowhere like what you would have been eating if the BT toxin was being sprayed on the plant and then you wash it off at home, right? And so this causes a problem because it becomes a potential allergen. So now you're eating something that human beings have never evolved to eat large quantities of, and it comes from a bacteria, a bacteria that's related to the anthrax bacteria, almost exactly the same, and you're going to be eating it in large amounts because if it's BT processed corn, that corn is going to be in a lot of different processed foods. So you're not just going to be eating it once in a while, you're going to be eating it in large quantities all the time. The other thing is BT cotton. The actual cotton that comes out of that process also has this BT on it. So not only are you eating it, you're wearing it too, right? So you're starting to increase the amounts of exposure. And any time that you're increasing amounts of exposure to these things, then you can start creating health problems, right? So if somebody asks you, you know, why it is that you're opposed, you know, a lot of it should be placed on the fact that these are potential allergens, right? The other thing that's a big, huge GMO crop is the Roundup Ready varieties, right? And so the Roundup Ready varieties, the way that they made those is they are tolerant to the pesticide glyphosate. And glyphosate 
is um, it's it, it's used to interrupt the way that the plant can actually make sugars, right? And so if it's a weed, then if you put the glyphosate on it, it basically can't make its sugars, and so it dies, right? And so what they, these guys did is they put in an alternative pathway from a bacteria so that it could withstand the glyphosate on it, okay? The problem isn't particularly with what they put into the plant. The problem is, is that they're drenching the plant in glyphosate. And, and uh, Monsanto swore up and down that glyphosate was non-toxic. And for a long time, they put out all sorts of advertisements saying, you know, oh, your pets can eat this stuff, it's fine, you can eat this stuff, it's fine, it's biodegradable, there's all these wonderful things about it, right? The reality is, is that none of that's true. It, it's not biodegradable. It goes into the water system, and it doesn't break down in your body, and it, it poisons you. It causes all sorts of different problems, and they're finding now that it causes kidney disease, liver disease. It can cause infertility after three generations with mice. There's all sorts of studies that show that glyphosate is not a good thing, and we're increasing our exposure to glyphosate by eating these glyphosate-resistant plants. Not only that, we're drenching our soils in the glyphosate. And that glyphosate is having an effect on the microorganisms inside the soil. And so the entire ecology of the ground that these plants are growing in is being completely messed up. And what that brings, what, what, that, what that causes, is now they're seeing that there's new microorganisms, new pathogenic microorganisms that are taking over inside of these soils and are infecting the plants. And then when animals eat these plants, they're having spontaneous abortions, late-term abortions. So, so a lot of farmers are really concerned because their livestock are dying after they've been feeding them their, these GMOs. So there's a lot of unintended consequences that come from these things, right? And so we really need to understand that Producing food isn't like producing cars. It's a, it's a systemic process. It's not just the plant itself. You have to take care of the soil, and then you also have to make sure that the residues and things from these pesticides don't get into the water system and cause all sorts of downstream problems as well, right? So I just wanted to share, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of talks, you know, a lot of times Monsanto and Syngenta will claim that there are no studies that show that GMOs are unsafe. And that's actually not true. There is a study, his name is Arpad Putstai, and Arpad Putstai did some, uh, did some studies for um, Great Britain. And Great Britain was all ready to jump on the GMO bandwagon. They thought, oh, this is great, you know, we can, uh, we can figure out how to, how to you know, save our plants if we're gonna have some sort of virus or you know, some sort of fungal infection, we can take care of it quickly. So they created this uh, institute, and the institute's whole purpose was to test these plants and the safety of these plants. And so Arpad Kutstai did an experiment, and everybody thought that this experiment was, you know, it's going to show, it's going to prove the safety of GMOs. And the experiment was, is they had genetically modified a potato, to express a certain protein in it that would allow it to be resistant to I insects, right? And so what he did is he tested that genetically modified potato, and he also tested just the potato plus the protein without being in the plant. So the protein that it was being made in the plant, but outside. So he wanted to test it. And, and the reason for that was he wanted to see, is there a difference between having the potato with the protein as opposed to the potato making the protein inside of it. And everybody thought, all the scientists thought, well, of course, there's not going to be any difference, right? But that, that's, this whole, that's the whole idea behind Monsanto's push that it, it, it's uh, equivalent, basically, right? It's the same thing. It's just having the protein and the, and the plant. There's no difference because we put it in the plant. And so what he found was that the potato with the protein in the plant 
caused hyperproliferation of cells in the lower intestine, which means that the cells were starting to grow fast. And that's a real bad sign. That's like a precursor to cancer, right? And it also makes um, the cells more susceptible to viral infections and all sorts of other things, mutations, stuff like that. And so he went and he told his supervisors, you know, they were going to go ahead and publish these results. And <laughs> his annual contract at Rowlett was not renewed following the incident. He was fired from his job. And he was basically, it was like a witch hunt, right? So a lot of people wonder, okay, well, why, why aren't the scientists working on this? Why aren't the scientists coming out with studies showing what's going on? Well, Monsanto will not allow us to study the protein as it's made in the plant. They won't allow us because it's, it's intellectual property rights. So you have to get permission from Monsanto or Syngenta or whoever to test those proteins, right? And if you're going to publish something, you definitely have to get their permission, right? But guess what? They're not giving the permission. And if they do give the permission, they have the right to look at your studies before they're released. And if they don't like what they, what they see, then they just won't allow them to be released. And so it's really horrible from a scientist's standpoint because we want to understand why is it that there's a difference, right? What, what's going on? How, how can we figure out to make this sort of stuff safer? Or, you know, what, what are we missing in, in you know, the rationalization of this? And they're just not allowing it to happen. The other thing that's really troubling is that there are ways to make these genetically modified plants so that they do not pass on their genes, so that the genes, the genetic modification doesn't go into the pollen. It stays in the, in the plant but doesn't go into the pollen. There are ways. There have been ways. And they're not doing it. And so to me that means that that's, that's on purpose, you know, and so their entire, their entire, you know, cost-benefit ratio is, okay, well, you know what, if, if it does spread, then the places that it spreads to, well, we can go ahead and say, hey, you're patent infringement, you know, you guys, you guys are, uh, you guys need to pay us now because you have our genes in your plants, and it allows them to basically spread their technologies through kind of terrorist met methods, right? Um, from what I heard is that Brazil outlawed GMOs and some, somehow their plants got mixed up with GMOs. And what they were saying is, is that they think that Monsanto, and I, I don't know this, but the claim was is that they were being given free seed in unlabeled bags and that the people were planting it then and then when it contaminated their food system they couldn't just completely erase all their food they had to decide okay we'll, we'll allow GMOs now right so those are, those are some of the troubling things and you know I, I, I would like to share with everybody you know that there are studies out there and if anybody ever comes up to you and says oh you know you're irrational and you know, there's, there's no proof. That's absolutely not true. There is a lot of proof that this stuff is happening. Um, the other thing that's for potential concern is we just, there's just a paper that just came out recently, and um, they found out that the actual genetic material from a plant, when you eat it, and they were, they were talking about rice, white rice, not genetically modified, but just white rice. And they found that the genes in the plant can actually have an effect on your genes. And so when you eat a plant, it all doesn't get broken down into little building blocks so that you can build it up however you want. Sometimes those building blocks or those little pieces kind of get through. And when they get through, they can actually have an effect on your genes, right? And that's all right with a plant that, you know, we've evolved with and we've eaten for many years and, you know, and cultures have had, had no problems with. But when you're talking about plants that are now making pesticides, when you're talking about plants that have these different genes in them that have never been in those, those, those particular varieties before and that we haven't been eating for, you know, thousands of years, then you start to have some problems, right? 
And the other thing is that the way that they're putting these genes into the plant, they're putting them in random areas. They're not putting them in a particular area. And so you don't know what kind of effect that random integration can have on the nutritional quality of the plant, on the disease resistance of the plant, all sorts of things. And that's actually why they're outlawing BT cotton in India right now. It's because, you know, they were sold BT cotton. They're saying, hey, your yields are going to go up. And they did it. And all these people, all these farmers are committing suicide. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like thousands of people that are committing suicide because, you know, they, they lose their entire cotton plants to some other disease that maybe their natural cotton plants or native cotton plants never had any problems with. And it's because these genetically modified organisms are sometimes actually weaker than, than, the, uh, than the wild type organisms. So if anybody would like to talk about any of these topics or have any more questions, I'd, I'd love to answer. Go ahead. Okay, so the way that they get it into the plants is they use, so there's, there's this, uh, there is a um, bacteria that kind of has a, a relationship with a plant. It grows in its roots. And what happens is it makes kind of like a little like tumor type thing on the root of the plant. And what it does is it takes some of its DNA and it inserts it into the plant DNA and it makes that plant produce a sugar that only it can eat. And so that way it can kind of survive inside the plant. And that's natural, right? So there's bacteria that are doing genetic modification already, right? And so what we did is we took that technology and applied it towards putting whatever genes we want. So we swap out the instructions for the protein that it made and or that sugar that it made and put whatever we want into it. But it, it's not it's not something that, oh well we know exactly where we're putting it in. It's something that's random. And then there's another way of doing it is with viruses. So there's viruses can also put pieces of DNA into organisms, and they do all the time. We actually have pieces of viral DNA in us right now um, from the evolution of organisms. So they go ahead and they use these viruses, and the viruses also integrate randomly to go ahead and put in these genes. Yeah. Yeah, the way the way that they actually create the uh, the plants is plants have the ability to grow from just one cell in any part of the plant. You can grow the entire plant from just one cell, and uh, that's how they do it. They they grow them on little petri dishes with nutrient solution, and then they go ahead and they pick the ones that work out the best. I have another question for you now. Okay, you know they um, have this brand food. Okay, so GMOs right now, I'm asking kind of like where where are they in our food supply? They're not in whole food, but that's changing. They're, they have now approved sweet corn that has been genetically modified to be sold um, as a whole food, and that's the first one. Um, oh, and, then, and the, the rainbow papaya is another one that they have out on the market. But most of the other stuff, like the BT corn and potatoes and things like that, are actually in processed foods. They're not in whole foods, um, or they're animal feed. And that's not good either, because if it's an animal feed, you're concentrating the toxic load into the animal, and then you're consuming it, in the case of pesticide-resistant plants. So, so getting sick from this is actually a toxic thing. It's not, you know, it, it's not something that you can take medicine for. It's something that you have to avoid the toxin, right? So it's just like, you know, if you expose yourself to gasoline and it makes you sick, the only way that you're going to get over that is by not exposing yourself to gasoline anymore, right? So, so the whole point of this is that we need to know what, what foods are GMOs so that if we are having an adverse reaction, we can trace it back 
to where where the source is, right? And right now we don't have any way of doing that. So that's why it's so important. You don't want to know. I guess this doesn't work. Actually, I uh, gave a talk on Hawaii Public Radio about all this, and it's archived. It's under um, Town Town Square. I think it's Town Square, and uh, you can get on Town Square website for Hawaii Public Radio. And I believe the archive is August 16th, and uh, and we we do a little talk about all this. I kind of go over it, but I haven't published anything particularly on this. Um, I am published, but it's for other things, right? I have. So, so the way that the regulation on GMOs is done right now, a lot of people don't know this, but um, one of the big things that Monsanto got approved was that they they basically came up with this principle of substantial equivalence which is what they base their entire regulation thing on, basically saying that the process of putting a gene or a protein into the plant and make, having the plant make it is no different than just having the protein in the plant, right? And that because that's true, that there's no need for testing of the plants themselves. And so that's how they got a around having the FDA do the own testing on, on the plants. So they get, a, they, they get away with going ahead and doing their own testing, and then they submit what they've done to the FDA, and the FDA basically just stamps it and says, okay, cool, you know, we trust you. And the problem with that is that it's very easy as a scientist, uh, knowing what you don't want to see, to design the experiments so that you don't see it, right? So they're designing their experiments so that they don't, you don't see the bad stuff, right? And so there's a lot of other scientists out there that want to do a little bit more thorough testing, but they're not allowing that. I, so. have, a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, and it might be difficult for you to answer, but recently, uh, through the past few years, Monsanto has given money to the uh, University of Hawaii CETAR College of Tropical Agriculture and, and Human Resources. How dangerous is that to the academic process and the research on GMOs and people. Well, um, yeah, it, 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 you know, it's funny because <laughs> I came from CTAR and uh, I remember I, I, uh, I, I won this poster, or not poster, but a presentation thing for a symposium and the award ceremony, <laughs> I was seated with Monsanto. <laughs> And I was like looking around, and I'm like, why was I put with the Monsanto table? And I actually said that, and uh, they're like offended, you know. And, <laughs> but what the reason is is because they were giving all the money for the awards and the prizes, right? And so, yeah, Monsanto and these companies do have really tight links with the agricultural sector in our university. And I, I think that's really a bad thing, you know, because what ends up happening is that if there's any sort of research that's coming out of the university that's against that company, then the administrators of the school are more likely to want to squash it or not publish it or basically, you know, have a witch hunt for whatever scientist is putting it out there, right? Because you're, you're putting too much influence from the private sector onto this area. But the biggest thing that's standing in the way of, you know, really doing research on this is the intellectual property right, right? And so we can't test the protein inside the plant. We can't do the, the tests. They won't allow us to do the tests. And so if you can't test it, 
how how are you going to tell that it's safe or not? You know, and so that's that's the problem that we're having. Thank you. And if it was safe, well, why not run the test? Exactly. Yeah. If there's nothing to hide, then why why are you hiding? So. Okay. Um. Yeah, there's actually been a lot of lawsuits against them. Um, so I know one in particular was with Syngenta, because Syngenta was using a pesticide on corn, and they claimed that it wouldn't get into the water table, and they found that there was huge contamination of the water table uh, with this particular pesticide, and so they went ahead and sued them. And, what happens is they always settle out of court, right? And so when they settle out of court, then they can say, oh, well, there's, you know, there's no case that you actually won that says that we did something wrong, right? Did anybody got sick with Oh, yeah, a lot of people got sick. What's, what's really interesting, a lot of people don't really know who Monsanto is. Monsanto is a big, huge chemical company. Um, they, they started making PCBs, right. which are like one of the worst things ever. They completely destroyed a town that now has super sky-high rates of cancer because of all the PCBs and stuff that they went ahead and dumped into their area. So, I mean, these people do not have a good track record of, you know, taking care of the messes that they make at all or being honest about it. Is that Agent Orange? Agent Orange, yeah. But they had no think. checks and balances when they created that. Yeah. And then also politically, Clarence Thomas, he was a top Monsanto lawyer. Yeah. Now yeah, that's that's the other thing that they talk about is the revolving door with Monsanto and the government. You know, is that a lot of people that are in Monsanto higher up, uh, you know, end up going and working for the regulatory agencies and vice versa, and then they keep going back and forth, back and forth. You know, and how is that? How is that good? How is that going to inspire any sort of trust in the process? And it doesn't, and it shouldn't, and we should be outraged, and we should demand that there be no, uh, you know, basically revolving door between these two, you know, that you can't have a conflict of interest like that, especially if you're supposed to be taking care of public health. Yeah, uh, the government, like, for the no, what's really interesting to me is that corporations have filed really, really hard to, to gain the right of personhood. So, right, so now they're people, and they can still go and basically poison and murder, because that's what it is, by poisoning all these poor people that, you know, poor eight-year-old kids that have leukemia now, you know, and people that are, that are dying. For, for generations because because of their pollution and because of their irresponsibility and their lies and yet how, how how do we hold them accountable if they're people then can't we hold them accountable for criminal negligence and get rid of them well no actually you can't because they'll just hire another CEO and now it's a different different thing so kind of frustrating so basically all I can say is, you know, before, definitely push for labeling. And if you know anybody in California, make sure that that labeling thing passes in California in November and pass that on, pass the information on to people, you know, try to share. There's, there's a, a great book called uh, GMO Myths, Truths and Myths, and it, it just came out. And uh, it basically was a scientific paper that went through and looked to see if the claims made by the genetically modified organisms were actually true, if we're using less pesticide, if it increases yield, you know, if it's actually safe. And they found out that basically they had lied on all of it. It doesn't increase yield, it doesn't reduce pesticide use, it actually increases it. So, uh, you know, passing on that information and letting people know, I mean, before we have labels, Buy organic, buy local, go to your farmer's market, support your CSAs, you know, community-supported agriculture, get online, you know, that's, that's the only way you're going to know is by actually getting more in touch with your food. And I think, you know, with, with the whole industrialized food system, we have lost 
touch with our food and that this is why this is happening right now is because we've lost that connection to our food and I mean our food is our medicine our food is what we are and if we lose that connection then this is what happens you know thank you Anita Matthew University of Hawaii That was awesome, huh? Yeah. Just go really new with a lot of stuff in the world. See what's going on here. Let's see what this sign is about. Hey, I, we saw... That's a babe against biotech. This is a good sign. I'm just trying to catch all the traffic. They're just like stock, you know? Yeah, we are on. This is uh, Ward Avenue. It's uh, 524 in Honolulu, and this is one of the main uh, thoroughfares. This is Ward Avenue traffic. We're looking up toward Baratania as a cross street. This is the uh, the Occupy encampment. Uh, was in this area to begin with, where this uh, canopy is now. And uh, that was put up actually this morning. Uh, it's a, it's a taken down at night. The encampment itself is um, along the side of the road. Maybe we'll take a, take a look at it here. This is our part of uh, our September 17th. Uh, happy birthday to Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Monsanto, and uh, why are we here? Not even one criminal charge or DOJ investigation against Predator Bank. Yes, what I'll do is uh, I'll walk down and sign off after we see the tents here. Tents are along the side of the road now, very odd. It strikes some people, but the only place uh, that the tents can be erected and to remain, kind of. The law was passed at the end of last year, Bill 54, now Ordinance 11-029, subjects these to um, threats all the time. And they've made, uh, police have made 42 uh, raids across the street in the little Museum of Art formerly the Anna Rice Cook Estate, Castle and Cook. Charles Montague Cook was also um, at Sea Brewer, another one of the big five. And this, where we'll sign off, where it's a very pleasant view of uh, Thomas Square, named after Admiral Richard Dalton Thomas, I believe, who restored uh, Sovereignty to the Hawaiian people, July 31st, 1843. So for now, I'm going to sign off. You can join us later. We're going to march to University of Hawaii, Manoa Campus, to uh, protest their taking money in from Monsanto. Uh, we'll be camped on the corner of University and Dole. We'll march there in about an hour. Uh, so the setup would be around 7. You know, I'm going to live stream from there. I think it should be really interesting. First time.